Greetings from Zurich. My apologies that I cannot be with you today, but let me try to at least use this way to give you some insights into three of the most important lessons, I believe, of the post-PRISM society. Firstly, what is PRISM? Maybe you've lived under a rock for the past couple of months, maybe you just shut off at some point and said, look, this is too much information, I can't process it, and you just stop following it. So let me try to just briefly summarize what is the most important information that we got from the PRISM leaks by Edward Snowden. PRISM is a surveillance program of the National Security Agency, the NSA of the United States. It is surveillance of the cloud. It is a total surveillance to some extent of the cloud. Um, so any cloud software as a service that is based out of a US company um, is under that surveillance. That means every email going through Google, every Facebook post, everything you put into Outlook.com or Office 365 is at least potentially being read by the NSA and the leaks by Edward Snowden say very clearly that if the NSA does want access, they will get access. PRISM revealed more though, and the PRISM leaks actually gave us a whole lot more information than that. Uh, because it's not just cloud services, it's also the software. The NSA has worked very specifically to undermine the security in proprietary applications, um, mostly and first and foremost, um, and have worked with the vendors to actually subvert those applications in order to give them access. In some ways that happened through weakening certain critical parts of the software, um, namely those that create random numbers so they're not quite as random so the NSA can have a good guess as to what your key might be. And sometimes it's through disclosures of vulnerabilities in the software to the NSA before they get fixed or disclosed elsewhere. That in particular is something that Microsoft has um, by now openly um, spoken about. And so we know that the NSA has access to virtually every version of Windows anywhere on this planet, not because Microsoft built in a backdoor, there's obviously been rumors about this, but because the NSA knows where the weak points are because Microsoft tells them. And that means that ultimately even if you run your local installation, the NSA has access if they want to. The question is, do they want to enough? Um, perhaps for some of you that answer is no. Um, but nonetheless, if they want to have access, they can get access. The other important part, and this is the part that is often a little bit missing from the conversation, is that all of this within the NSA, so they have the data, what happens to the data, the access to that data is warrantless, which means there is no judge actually overseeing this. Even the secret FISA court, which not often has to be consulted, in fact, there is mechanisms that bypass the court entirely um, for some of the requests. Um, but even that court has said, even for those requests we do get, we can't really monitor them. We have no way of knowing what happens there. And it's a secret court, so we don't know what is discussed. So it is warrantless, um, which means someone has access and we don't know who. And we don't know what they use it for. Now, many people have thought that's outrageous, this is obviously illegal, at least in, for, for their perception of what should be legal. But fact is, and that's the other revelation here, it's entirely legal. It is fully legal. It's under Patriot FISA Act. It is completely legal. In fact, the companies are compelled to work with the NSA and they are absolutely forbidden to talk about it. They cannot publicly discuss or disclose what is going on and in fact many things can even be discussed with the lawyers of the companies. People working for the companies in central positions don't know about this. Say Kaspar Bowden who's been giving an excellent presentation. If you ever want to learn a little bit more about all of this, I recommend his presentations on how to wiretap the cloud without almost anyone noticing. He was the chief privacy officer for Microsoft and he didn't know about this. So he was the person who in theory was responsible for making sure something like this does not occur and he wasn't even aware it was happening. 
So there's obviously uh, multiple layers of access in a company, so even the people working for these companies often don't know what's going on inside. And it's all legal. That I cannot stress that enough. It is all legal. So there are some corner cases where people say, well, maybe that was not quite legal, but to the largest extent, it's all legal. And a lot of legislations in the world actually have exceptions that make this legal, including, say, Germany. Um, Germany has in its Article 10 of the Constitution a carve out for Secret Service activity. So all the data protection laws don't apply. That to many people is something that is disturbing and frankly I am one of them. Because I believe there must be oversight, I believe there must be transparency in such a system always because otherwise you do not know what it is being used for. Now, that is precisely the point. What, it is, what is it being used for? Um, people say, well, it's for terrorism, right? That's the convenient thing to say. It's against terrorism, it's against very, very bad people that are out there to hurt you. But in fact, what also is obvious from the legislation itself, when you look at it, it's about po protecting the interests of the United States and to some extent that of its allies, but allies here means in particular those that are very closely involved with the same kind of activities, which are the so-called Five Eyes countries, that the United States, the United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. They have a very, very strong compact internally to work together, so very often the data um, that is shared between them will give them a much more complete picture, and it's been the UK government with the GCHQ um, and this Tempora program that actually have been doing a lot of the wiretapping in Europe. So all of this is one big surveillance complex that is governmental, and used for certain interests, and those interests, as we have seen, are actually political and economic. Um, and the only carve-out for this, the only protection against this, is ultimately, for the, in the US case, from the Fourth Amendment, which only covers US citizens. So when you see the entire debate that is taking place right now in the US, it's mostly about stop spying on US citizens. Everyone else is still game. Um, there's no real push for the US to give up its actual interest-based politics with regards to the rest of the world. And we have learned from the leaks um, saying that um, the president of Brazil was um, email surveyed, um, Angela Merkel in Germany was um, phone wiretapped, um, large um, um, oil company in Brazil being wiretapped for economic purposes purely. None of this is obviously related to terrorism in any way, shape or form. This is purely political, it's purely economic and it's well within the mandate of what that legislation actually says. It is precisely what that legislation was made for. So people are very surprised now um, and frankly all I can say to that is, oh really? Um, we've known this for a very, very, very long time. Um, the very first accounts and public documented accounts of um, creating backdoors in software, in particular proprietary software, because you don't know what's in there, so it's the easiest to actually um, subvert. Um, they go back to 1998. Um, you know, look on, on say the Heise forums for some of the backdoors that they have documented. This is not new. Um, Echelon has been discussed for a very long time, but mostly been under the label of "Ooh, look, there's a conspiracy theory going on here." Um, I'm sure the U.S. wouldn't do that and wouldn't use that information. And we have known for long before those leaks that no matter where the data is stored, the US government has access. Um, both Microsoft and Google have publicly confirmed that no matter what they guarantee you in terms of where that data is stored, if whether it's in a Dutch data center, or a Belgian data center, Swiss data center, it doesn't really matter. No matter where that data is stored worldwide, um, even if they give you the assurance it's stored in your country, the US government has access purely by virtue of going through the legal nexus that is Google in the US. So yes, um, they do have access no matter where. And we've known this since before those leaks. So 
to some extent one can only say the surprise that we see today is surprising. Um, we have known this for a while, we could have known this, we should have known this, we should have taken this into account way earlier, um, but the fact is that only very few people actually were really doing that. So the motivations, I mean we've spoken about the motivations, the motivations are very clearly and primarily economic and political. If you know the actual information that is going within a government in, certain, in the sense of where are our critical points, what is important to us in this trade negotiation, if we you know, give up at this point, can we perhaps convince them to give up that point, it gives you unbelievable leverage to know what the other party is planning. Kind of like playing a poker game and you see the other player's card. Um, so yes, that kind of information is power and the US has always been very, very pragmatic about obtaining and using that kind of power. The Germans have a very nice word for this called Realpolitik and it's kind of ironic that now the Germans seem to be the most surprised because, well, the US have always had that attitude and there is no questioning that general principle of how to behave. Um, they obey with international regulations when it suits them and otherwise don't. Um, and of course, business secrets. I mean, this whole world is in a very, very complicated trade war, some people even say, and knowing more gives you a local champion an edge. So the US uses that to benefit its own industry at the detriment, of course, of everyone else's. They get away with this because, frankly, they have the means and most other people don't. And because they have deliberately sabotaged any attempt to regulate this kind of thing on an international level for the past years because they figured, and obviously rightly so, that they had the biggest means, no one else could stand up to them. So people are very concerned about this now, that the government is doing this. But what is interesting, or perhaps even strange, at least to me, is why is it worse if a government does it? Is it really that much better when it's done purely for shareholder value? Because Bruce Schneier often says that surveillance is the business model of the internet. A lot of the cloud services that are very popular today base their entire business model around surveillance. It's about getting the most out of the data of the customers. Um, Bruce Schneier has this very interesting little quip about how people complain to him about you know, Google's customer support being really, really, really poor. To which he says, well, no, it's not poor. Actually, the customer support is really, really good but as a product, you are not entitled to it. Because the users are the products, the customers are the ones who pay. The users typically don't pay, they get the service for free, when actually it's not free. I mean, you're putting yourself under surveillance, but it seems free, and agree to having their data sold to someone else. Not in the literal sense, typically, metadata that is gleaned off this, patterns, behavior, and so on and so forth, but the amount of knowledge that is agglomerated in those very large companies is amazing. They know more about us, more about you, than we often do ourselves. Um, starting from the weird algorithms that Google has to predict which employee is likely to leave the company soon. You don't think that they could use that on your data? to figure out who of your employees might currently be unhappy and whether perhaps they should give them an ad that says, you know, why don't you go for this headhunting agency? They seem to often work do business for people like you. So they have information that you don't have even on your own data set. So yeah, so what is worse? That a democratically legitimized government for, you know, all the flexibility of what is democratic because frankly the US system in my view has quite some defects but it's a democratic country nonetheless 
So a democratically legitimized government using that information, is that really worse than a non-legitimized entity that does this purely for shareholder value? Personally, I would say there is a certain level of um, discrepancy here in the sense of trust or distrust that a lot of people bring towards these different entities. Fact is also that if people were not using those surveillance-based commercial services, the surveillance of the government would not be that pervasive because they rely, in fact, they build upon that commercial surveillance. So it's our usage patterns really that have made this possible. And the obvious concern here is um, that privacy is an essential right. Privacy is an essential component of any society, in particular any democratic society. There's very good psychological studies that do show how at the end of the day your mental decision as to if I say this will there be repercussions, that you know scissor in your head that says can I say this? Can I say this safely? Is this an opinion I may express? Or will this be illegal in five years from now? Will in four years from now the government decide that anyone who held that opinion has a higher chance of being a terrorist? Um, that fear of somehow being held accountable to what you think and say and mean um, on a level that you cannot judge, where you do not know the rules that will apply to this in the future, makes you extremely careful. So you will often then not stand up, you will not talk out, you will say, maybe this is not important enough for me to risk everything, maybe I should actually just not say this. And that is a problem for democracy, for any free society. A free society requires privacy. Um, I've been giving a speech at the WTO public forum just a few weeks back about what we do in terms of protecting privacy of our own users. And a lady from Australia was actually then asking us, yeah, but you know, if you do this whole privacy thing, are you not, you know, virtually it? She made the accusation that we were enabling crime and terrorism. But the point is, there is measures in place to access data if it is for actual purposes of criminal prosecution. We have lawful interception capabilities. The police usually has ways of actually asking for data if it is required. Um, depending on the country, those laws work better or worse, um, but there is a mechanism, and there's even a mechanism for this to cooperate internationally. Um, and yes, when there's an actual crime being committed, um, the interest of society to protect itself then starts to outweigh eventually um, the, the interest of the criminal in their own privacy. That is certainly true, but that is an extremely difficult balance to strike. It must be erring on the side of caution. Ultimately, I believe privacy right now has been cut back to such an extent that we have quite some way to regain it um, for us to arrive at a sensible point. And privacy, from the social and, and overall perspective, has a, has a very different other aspect as well, which is in the whole privileged information between business partners slash doctor-patient confidentiality, the requirement for journalists sometimes to protect their sources because sometimes those sources reveal information that the government actually does not want to see revealed. It's very clear. It's part of what a government, uh, what a journalist does. They are supposed to be monitoring the government for things that the government does wrong. Now, if the government has ways of cutting that information, the journalists can no longer do their job. So they do require a more protected zone, as do lawyers, who are often are up against the government in the sense of the public prosecutor's office as a part of the official government of any country, in a way. 
medical information. Medical information is extremely sensitive. The, the information you can get out of that um, and the secondary use of it, starting from profiling over your insurance suddenly gets more expensive, over you don't get that job. There's all sorts of repercussions here. And privacy concerns purely on the point of embarrassment. You don't want everyone to know about perhaps you have a particularly ugly mole on your butt cheek. It's completely your thing. I mean, if you don't like that, that's fine. And you should not be forced to reveal that to anyone. So for anyone who is in any field that has any elevated level of needed, needed protection, lawyers, coaches, medical professionals, journalists, all of these people require privacy and right now when using any of the US services they don't have it and that is a problem because think of the political manipulation that becomes possible when say you're coaching someone in a central position in a company, a government, any kind of decision-making role and you learn about something that embarrassed them in their childhood and they still feel uneasy about today. And now assume someone gets that knowledge who has an interest in manipulating their decision. Um, you will never know of this. It opens up all possible channels of influence, influence all the way to blackmail um, that we as a society really don't want to open. So yes, I think you should be concerned and I think you should take care of protecting that information because ultimately there's a very central question here. The question is why should your customers, why should your clients, why should your partners trust you? Why should they trust you with their information which they always provide to you by means of sharing information with you, sending you email, giving you documents? Why should they trust that you keep this confidential and safe? Um, and that is something where this becomes part of the essential building block of what your company can provide as a value offering. Now there's three points here that uh, have become very clear to me. Number one is legislation beats technology and encryption. We had this idea, this like naive thought that the internet and the new technologies and the power of encryption would somehow empower all the people who previously you know, had no power and give them the power and take it away from the government so the government kind of becomes almost obsolete. I mean, some people even think we now are approaching this transnational state of things where you know, the world is free and open and we all work together, we all have privacy and it's all great and the governments kind of just fulfill a couple of menial roles that are otherwise not very important. I think that's not right. Um, again, quoting Bruce Schneier, his view on this is that the internet is a multiplier of power. It has multiplied the power we have. Um, so if you had a lot of power, and governments do, then you will gain a whole lot more power in, a, in, in addition. Whereas if you had little power, you still gain a lot. Nonetheless, um, you're still not more powerful than the government is. And in fact, we've seen now that also the very large companies that are international often don't pay any taxes, you know, can get away with all sorts of things. They cannot actually undo that fundamental power inequality that comes from law. The law is more powerful and it beats the technology. It beats the encryption. Um, look at how companies such as Lavabit had to shut down simply because there was no way they could refuse um, and now find themselves in a legal repercussion situation where they don't know what's going to happen to them so they have a le big legal defense fund now to somehow try to get out of this. Um, they are now trying to find more technical solutions to somehow this problem but ultimately the big problem is the law at the end of the day remains more powerful so the question you need to ask yourself is what legislation applies to my technology what legislation applies to what I do on a computer where I store my data where I run my company and perhaps even how does it compare I mean this is a very strong argument on the one hand for choosing local suppliers perhaps even local small businesses because you have no choice about your local legislation applying to you. 
if you live in a country that legislation applies to you now if you work with an IT supplier that is a large multinational that IT supplier will ultimately also have to, com to comply with the laws in all sorts of countries if they have a connection to any of the five vice countries legally um, most likely the US government will find a way to muscle itself in and you won't know because perhaps they don't have an interest in going out of business no, that means a local SME that is either only in your country or only in a set of countries that you trust, that actually would have, legally speaking at least, a much, much better value proposition. The alternative is you choose suppliers that are based in legislations that are better than your own, that have more protection, provide a better framework to protect privacy. And, I mean, Speaking from my own perspective, the only two real candidates right now, right now seem to be Iceland and Switzerland. In Switzerland, we actually have an extremely strong protection for privacy. There is no backdoors, there is never any warrantless access to data. There must always be a warrant by a Swiss judge. And a Swiss judge can only give that warrant if the evidence of the crime is concrete it is severe enough under Swiss law and there is no other likely chance to obtain enough evidence to then prosecute. If those three criteria are met, then the warrant is given and it is recorded and is made transparent later on where, like in which canton and under which paragraph an email surveillance was approved. You can get the statistics, you can download them, ironically, as an Excel sheet, but nonetheless, you can download them and filter for what you're looking for. And you will see that in the last year, we had about 20 such cases retroactively, and I think another 20 or so um, that ongoing, as in live. That's, uh, if, you, if they, it's not the same, there might be some overlap between them. That's a maximum of total 40 cases in a country of several million inhabitants that hosts data from all over the world. So it gives you an idea of how strong that barrier to access is here. And that is why Switzerland right now has become one of the most interesting places to host data in our view. Secondly, use free software, use open source and focus on open standards because they give you some more freedom to interact with others. Ultimately, the funny part that most people haven't yet caught on to is the fact that Bruce Schneier and Kasper Bowden, who both are strong critics of what the NSA has done, and the NSA itself, agree upon the fact that free software, open source, is the technology to use. Because it's the hardest to subvert. Um, it is virtually impossible, typically, to find a clear subversion path into it that can later not be detected. It's very hard to do. Um, so the chance that that will succeed is much, much lower and the chance that it will get fixed is much higher if it actually succeeds. There are some good documented cases of this and in fact um, the re issue resolution speed in free software is much higher than in anything else. So even if there is a problem, it gets, fi it gets fixed very quickly and there's clearly no secret um, disclosure channel of a vulnerability that would then otherwise not be um, told to anyone else. Now, that's why Casper Bowden now says he no longer uses Microsoft, he uses free software. Um, he's based on Linux today. Bruce Schneier says he does the same thing. He uses GNU PG from Germany, which is an open PGP implementation that is free software. And um, so, you, so you have suddenly all these people agreeing on this because even the NSA uses Linux. In fact, they've contributed to Linux to make it more secure. Now, some people say perhaps they were trying to subvert it as they were doing it. But personally, I doubt it for the simple reason that even the NSA requires something they can run and trust to a certain level. So I think that a lot of that technology is probably sound because the NSA always knew that this would never be all that pervasive in the desktop, or they at least assumed that at the time. Um, so they said, well, you know, the desktop we can only so always subvert. We have Microsoft to work with, not, not a problem. So I think the argument that um, they have subverted SE Linux in particular 
I mean, by now you don't know anything for sure anymore, you don't know for certain, but um, I think there's good reason to believe that probably that is not fully subverted at least, or at least um, reliable enough that it's not easy to break in. And then of course, lesson number three, and this is the one that is, well I guess that's an internal one, it's ultimately beware of the marketing or the hidden costs. Now that the whole Prism thing has come out, there's a whole lot of um, offers that claim to offer security, um, that claim to offer privacy, that claim to actually provide you a way out of this. Um, I'm not going to talk about them because um, that's uh, uh, an entirely unpleasant affair, but I would encourage you to think beyond the marketing and um, also look at the um, hidden costs of some services um, that you choose. At the end of the day, I think what you want to do is you want to look for services that are run by companies that have sufficient technical credibility that they can actually provide the service, technically sound, that work on the technology themselves actively because um, you want that technology to continue to exist, that provide it as open source um, because you don't want that technology to depend only upon that one business. You want it to, de to be a broader technology that can be adopted by third parties and where you have the choice to move to self-hosting if you ever wanted that or move to another supplier if that is what you want to do. That freedom actually is important to you and it keeps the entire ecosystem honest, which I think is important. So your choice has power. And uh, look at whether a company is actually running its own service, by the way, because a lot of them today are offering this off rented servers that they have no physical control over, sometimes even virtual servers. In both cases, the um, certificates that are used for encryption, the encryption could be perfect, but the certificates can be entirely compromised and they wouldn't even know themselves. So look at those aspects and um, be a slightly critical consumer, please, because I think being not critical enough is kind of what got us into this mess in the first place. And when you look at things, we'd be very glad if you also took a look at Colab and um, what we do, we provide this for you as a 100% free software solution, 100% open source, and the most radical open standards approach in our field, full collaboration, um, locally installed, white label for ISPs, or as a secure collaboration as a service from Switzerland, which is the MyColab platform which we've launched. Um, don't believe me though, just go critically ask questions, contact me, here's my email address, and thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy the conference.